the Bonus Army was the popular name of an assemblage of some 43,000 Marchers Euro 17,000 World War I veterans, their families, and affiliated groups of Euro, who gathered in Washington, D.C., in the spring and summer of 1932 to demand cash payment redemption of their service certificates. Its organizers called it the Bonus Expeditionary Force to echo the name of World War I's American Expeditionary Forces, while the media called it the Bonus March. It was led by Walter W. Waters, a former Army sergeant. Many of the war veterans had been out of work since the beginning of the Great Depression. The World War Adjusted Compensation Act of 1924 had awarded them bonuses in the form of certificates they could not redeem until 1945. Each service certificate, issued to a qualified veteran soldier, bore a face value equal to the soldier's promised payment plus compound interest. The principal demand of the bonus army was the immediate cash payment of their certificates. Retired Marine Corps Major General Smidley Butler, one of the most popular military figures of the time, visited their camp to back the effort and encouraged them. On July 28, U.S. Attorney General William D. Mitchell ordered the veterans removed from all government property. Washington police met with resistance, shots were fired and two veterans were wounded and later died. President Herbert Hoover then ordered the Army to clear the veterans' campsite. Army Chief of Staff General Douglas MacArthur commanded the infantry and cavalry supported by six tanks. The bonus Army marchers with their wives and children were driven out, and their shelters and belongings burned. A second, smaller bonus march in 1933 at the start of the Roosevelt administration was diffused in May with an offer of jobs for the Civilian Conservation Corps at Fort Hunt, Virginia, which most of the group accepted. Those who chose not to work for the CCC by the May 22 deadline were given transportation home. In 1936, Congress overrode President Franklin D. Roosevelt's veto and paid the veterans their bonus nine years early. Background. In 1781, most of the Continental Army was demobilized. Two years later, hundreds of Pennsylvania War veterans marched on Philadelphia, then the nation's capital, surrounded the State House where the U.S. Congress was in session, and demanded back pay. Congress fled to Princeton, New Jersey, and several weeks later, the U.S. Army expelled the war veterans from Philadelphia. In response to that experience, the federal district is now directly governed by the U.S. Congress, now known as Washington, D.C., was excluded from the restrictions of the Posse Comitatus Act which forbade the use of the U.S. military for domestic police activity. The practice of wartime military bonuses began in 1776, as payment for the difference between what a soldier earned and what he could have earned had he not enlisted. Breaking with tradition, the veterans of the Spanish Euro American War did not receive a bonus, and, after World War I, their not receiving a military service bonus became a political matter when WWI veterans received only a $60 bonus. The American Legion, created in 1919, led a political movement for an additional bonus. On May 15, 1924, President Calvin Coolidge vetoed a bill granting bonuses to veterans of World War I saying, patriotism. Bought and paid for is not patriotism. Congress overrode his veto a few days later, enacting the World War Adjusted Compensation Act. Each veteran was to receive a dollar for each day of domestic service, up to a maximum of $500, and one dollar and 25 cents for each day of overseas service, up to a maximum of $625. Amounts of $50 or less were immediately paid. All other amounts were issued as certificates of service maturing in 20 years. 3,662,374 military service certificates were issued, with a face value of $3.638,000,000. Congress established a trust fund to receive 20 annual payments of $112 million that, with interest, would finance the 1945 disbursement of the $3.638 billion due the veterans. Meanwhile, veterans could borrow up to 22.5% of the certificate's face value from the fund. But in 1931, because of the Great Depression, Congress increased the maximum value of such loans to 50% of the certificate's face value. 
Although there was congressional support for the immediate redemption of the military service certificates, President Hoover and Republican congressmen opposed such action. They reasoned that the government would have to increase taxes to cover the costs of the payout, and thus any potential recovery would be slowed. The veterans of foreign wars continued to press the federal government to allow the early redemption of military service certificates. The first march of the unemployed was Cox's army in 1894, when armies of men from various regions streamed to Washington as a living petition to demand that the federal government create jobs by investing in public infrastructure projects. In January 1932, a march of 25,000 unemployed Pennsylvanians, dubbed Cox's Army, had marched on Washington, D.C., the largest demonstration to date in the nation's capital, setting a precedent for future marches by the unemployed. March, on June 15, 1932. The House of Representatives passed the wright patman bonus bill which would have moved forward the date for World War I veterans to receive their cash bonus. Most of the bonus army camped in Alverville on the Anacostia Flats, a swampy, muddy area across the Anacostia River from the Federal Corps of Washington, just south of the 11th Street bridges. The camps, built from materials scavenged from a nearby rubbish dump, were tightly controlled by the veterans who laid out streets built sanitation facilities, and held daily parades. To live in the camps, veterans were required to register and prove they had been honorably discharged. The Bonus Army massed at the United States Capitol on June 17 as the U.S. Senate defeated the bonus bill by a vote of 62-18. Police shooting, the marchers remained at their campsite waiting for President Hoover to act. On July 28, 1932, Attorney General William D. Mitchell ordered the police to remove the Bonus Army veterans from their camp. When the veterans moved back into it, police drew their revolvers and shot at the veterans, two of whom, William Husker and Eric Carlson, died later. William Husker was an immigrant to the United States from Lithuania. When the U.S. entered World War I in 1917, he sold his butcher shop in St. Louis, Missouri and joined the United States Army. After the war he lived in Chicago. Husker is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Eric Carlson was a U.S. veteran from Oakland, California. He fought in the trenches of France in World War I. He was interred in Arlington National Cemetery. When told of the shootings, President Hoover ordered the Army to evict the Bonus Army from Washington. U.S. Army intervention, at 4.45 p.m. Commanded by General Douglas MacArthur, the 12th Infantry Regiment, Fort Howard, Maryland, and the 3rd Cavalry Regiment, supported by six battle tanks commanded by Major George S. Patton, formed in Pennsylvania Avenue while thousands of civil service employees left work to line the street and watch. The bonus marchers, believing the troops were marching in their honor, cheered the troops until Patton ordered the cavalry to charge the Euro in action which prompted the spectators to yell, shame, shame. After the cavalry charged, the infantry, with fixed bayonets and tear gas entered the camps, evicting veterans, families, and camp followers. The veterans fled across the Anacostia River to their largest camp, and President Hoover ordered the assault stopped. MacArthur chose to ignore the president and ordered a new attack claiming that the bonus march was an attempt to overthrow the U.S. government. That is the false story put forward by Assistant Chief of Staff, George Van Horn Mosley. It was he who made sure MacArthur never received Hoover's order to stop to the Secretary of War, Patrick J. Hurley and the Assistant Secretary of War Ferrer who did not. Mosley was a known anti-Semite and neo-fascist yet his word has won out as his memoirs which made the claim came out just after MacArthur's death. The general never knew of the claim that he had been told. He did wrongly believe in there being an overthrow risk. MHQ 8-2 Winter 1996 MacArthur and the Marchers brings it all together. 55 veterans were injured and 135 arrested. A veteran's wife miscarried. When 12-week-old Bernard Myers died in the hospital after being caught in the tear gas attack, a government investigation reported he died of enteritis while a hospital spokesman said the tear gas didn't do it any good. During the military operation, Major Dwight D. Eisenhower, later the 34th President of the United States, 
served as one of MacArthur's junior aides. Believing it wrong for the Army's highest ranking officer to lead an action against fellow American war veterans, he strongly advised MacArthur against taking any public role, I told that dumb son of a bitch not to go down there, he said later. I told him it was no place for the chief of staff. Despite his misgivings, Eisenhower later wrote the Army's official incident report which endorsed MacArthur's conduct. Aftermath, Joe Angelo, a decorated hero from the war who saved Patton's life, approached him the day after to sway him. Patton, however, dismissed him quickly. This episode was said to represent the proverbial essence of the bonus army, each man the face of each side. Angelo the dejected loyal soldier, Patton the unmoved government instrument unconcerned with past duties. Though the bonus army incident did not derail the careers of the military officers involved, it proved politically disastrous for Hoover. He lost the 1932 election in a landslide to Franklin D. Roosevelt. MGM released the movie Gabriel over the White House in March 1933, the month Roosevelt was sworn in as president. Produced by William Randolph Hearst's Cosmopolitan Pictures, it depicted a fictitious President Hammond who, in the film's opening scenes, refuses to deploy the military against a march of the unemployed and instead creates an army of construction to work on public works projects until the economy recovers. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt judged the movie's treatment of veterans superior to Hoover's. During the presidential campaign of 1932, Franklin D. Roosevelt had opposed the veterans' bonus demands. But when they organized a second demonstration in May 1933, he provided the marchers with a campsite in Virginia and provided them three meals a day. Administration officials, led by presidential confidant Louis Howe, tried to negotiate an end to the protest. Roosevelt arranged for his wife Eleanor to visit the site unaccompanied. She lunched with the veterans and listened to them perform songs. She reminisced about her memories of seeing troops off to World War I and welcoming them home. The most she could offer was a promise of positions in the newly created Civilian Conservation Corps. One veteran commented, Hoover sent the army, Roosevelt sent his wife. In a press conference following her visit, the First Lady described her reception as courteous and praised the marchers, highlighting how comfortable she felt despite critics of the marchers who described them as communists and criminals. Roosevelt later issued an executive order allowing the enrollment of 25,000 veterans in the CCC, exempting them from the normal requirement that applicants be unmarried and under the age of 25. Congress, with Democrats holding majorities in both houses, passed the Adjusted Compensation Payment Act in 1936, authorizing the immediate payment of the $2 billion in WWI bonuses, and then overrode Roosevelt's veto of the measure. The House vote was 324 to 61, and the Senate vote was 76 to 19. See also, Cox's Army, James Renshaw Cox, List of Protest Marches on Washington, D.C. On to Ottawa Trek by Canadian Veterans, 1935. Notes Sources, Berner, David Herbert Hoover, A Public Life. New York, Alfred A. North. ISBN 0-394-46134-7. Daniels, Roger the Bonus March, An Episode of the Great Depression. Westport, Connecticut, Greenwood Publishing. Dixon, Paul and Thomas B. Allen The Bonus Army, An American Epic. New York, Walker and Company. ISBN 0-8027-1440-4. Dixon, Paul, and Thomas B. Allen. Marching on History, in Smithsonian, February 2003, James, D. Clayton The Years of MacArthur, Volume I, 1880-1941. Boston, Horton Mifflin. Lysio, Donald J. The President and Protest, Hoover, Conspiracy, and the Bonus Riot. Columbia, Missouri, University of Missouri Press. Smith, Richard Norton An Uncommon Man, The Triumph of Herbert Hoover. New York, Simon & Schuster. ISBN 0-671-46034-X. Leibovitch, Louis W. Bylines in Despair, Herbert Hoover. The Great Depression, 
and the U.S. news media ISBN 0-275-94843-9, Bennett, Michael J. When Dreams Come True, The G.I. Bill and the Making of Modern America ISBN 1-57488-218-X, Parrot, Jeffrey. MacArthur and the Marchers in MHQ Vol. 802 American Historical Publication, Inc. Further reading, Morrow, Felix the Bonus March. International Pamphlets No. 31. New York, International Publishers. Ortiz, Stephen A. 2006. Rethinking the Bonus March, Federal Bonus Policy, The Veterans of Foreign Wars, and the Origins of a Protest Movement. Journal of Policy History 18, No. 3, 275-303. Rawl, Michael J. Anacostia Flats. Baltimore, Publish America. ISBN 978-1-413-79778-7. Smith, Jean the Shattered Dream. New York, William Morrow and Company. External links, Sheila Cast. Soldier Against Soldier, The Story of the Bonus Army. NPR, Weekend Edition Sunday. The Bonus Army, Vets owe debt to WWI's Bonus Army from Military.com, FBI file on the Bonus Army, The Sad Tale of the Bonus Marchers, Memory, The Bonus Army March, Library of Congress, Paul Dixon and Thomas B. Allen on the Bonus Army, An American Epic, a lecture recorded at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library.